So hello and welcome to another episode of Oral Pathology Tuesdays. It is a great, great pleasure to have you all here in what appears to be, as far as the YouTube tells me, the 46th video. This time we are having, it is another one of the fundamental series where we build knowledge from the base up right to what is current. Now, every one of us, when we joined uh, dental school or the medical school, we realized and we thought very fast that a lot of what we do and what we learn is literally Greek and Latin. And all that Greek and Latin is supposed to actually help us understand things better. We also have a good sprinkling of, uh, you know, the inventors or the discoverer's name or the person who, you know, described the lesion first. And all of that, of course, with much great thanks to all those biologists and all those scientists and doctors who have found those things. But all of those names are also, by virtue of being from different regions, make it a little difficult to really remember and understand all of them. And all of this ends up with inevitably what turns out to be some form of uh, what I can only say as sort of a jeopardy uh, game very often in the exams where you have a rapid fire of being told a certain name and you're supposed to remember what it is all about. Uh, it's been difficult and especially difficult when you realize that what you're losing and uh, what you're likely to lose in those exams is marks and uh, it's your grades and not really just money that you could earn. So uh, there's a lot more at stake than a game. Uh, but all of that can be, you know, remedied and we hope to remedy that at least for four of those cells today but to achieve that we have with us Dr. Anita Spadigam who's going to talk about expressions of cell injury recognizing and interpreting uh, morphological alterations so today together it gives me great great uh, pleasure to welcome Dr. Anita Spadigam who is our uh, speaker for the day. She is the professor and head of department of Goa Dental College. It has taken me months to get her on the show and I'm very glad that she is finally here. We also have as the moderator another person we know very well, Dr. Kia Sarka. She is the professor and head of department, faculty of the, uh, dentistry, Jamia Milia Islamia. Uh, dental, uh, she is in the dental department, oral pathology section. And uh, uh, she, it's the, her first time on the channel, so we welcome her too. Very, very happy that you're both here. And with this, now I will stop sharing and we can start the presentation. Uh, yes, Anita, you can take it, please. Yeah. Okay, is the screen uh, uh, visible? Ah, uh, yes, it is. Okay, not able to get into. Okay, I'll just try that out again. Okay. Actually, your screen is uh... Your share is gone. Yes, I'm back now. Okay. Oh dear, there seems to be something not okay here again. One moment. Yeah. No worries. So dear friends, while you are waiting, if you have not already subscribed to the channel, please take the, take the opportunity to click the subscribe. It's a good use of your time and much appreciated. So yes, you have got the share. Yeah, now it's fine. Okay. Yes, and you can start. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Mandana, for having me on this Back to Basics platform. 
thank you, Dr. Kea, for joining in. And it's good to be back with the familiar, with old friends, and of course, with new. Now, coming to today's topic, cell signs, expressions of cell injury, recognizing and interpreting morphological alterations. Well, what can be more basic than the cell, be it in health or disease? Uh, sorry, Dr. All... Anita, can I interrupt you? Uh, yes. uh, you are sharing your screen with the notes. It's not showing the full slide. You want to okay. go into the, yeah. It is showing with the notes. Okay, how? Yeah, so that just sort of that. takes away some of our viewing space. All right. So shall I restart then? Yeah. Okay, just one moment. I'll get back to that. Yeah. You're basically seeing your uh, presenter's view. You need to see. Um, Yes, we got the right one. Yes, yes. Now yeah. we have the whole slide. Right. Yes. Okay. So, fine. We just begin again then. Yeah. So, as I said, what can be more basic than the cell? You know, whether it is in health or disease, we know that organisms are made up of organs, which then are composed of tissues. And then you come to the basic, that is the cell. As we all know, the basic fundamental unit of life, the structural and fundamental unit of life as it is called. Okay. Sorry, Mandana, I'm not able to move ahead. Okay. Right. So if expressions of cell injury can be analogous to a crime scene, then in the chain of custody, the clinician becomes the first responder. The patients go to him and say, well, they have a problem. And later, the clinician, of course, will collate the data and send us some part of what he thinks is important of evidence and the pathologist is the one who interprets that evidence and directs the investigative process. So right from the clinical notes to the grossing station to the stained slides on the tray, we need to look for answers to these questions. So what are the questions that you would be turning around in your mind as you try to come to you know, looking at what is the nature of the disease, what does it cause, the development, structural changes that we would be going to look at in histopathology, what are some of the clinical signs and symptoms, all of these are regular points or parameters that we follow when it comes to diagnosing a disease. So the questions that would be in your mind are those important questions, what, where, why, when, how, how has this problem occurred? Who is responsible for it is what we would want to know. So these are the questions that you would always be asking yourself when you are examining the tissues. So some time ago, Dr. Priya had conversations with a cell. Today, I'll call my presentation a cell interrogation. And like all suspects, you know, your questions, the questions, the interrogation of a suspect, you might just get stonewalled or might be given answers which are misleading. But then as you learn to recognize alterations in cell morphology and understand the mechanisms that are driving those alterations, you would be in a better position to interpret your findings in the context of the case at hand. And then be also, as we say, able to crack the case. 
So then we look at what are the points that we will be looking at today when we have a cell in focus. So we look at the cell, whichever cell we're going to be looking at today, what are its synonyms, where it is derived from, and of course, what are its morphological characters, identifying features, mechanisms which drive those alterations, and the contextual interpretation. That means the diseases in which these cells become diagnostic or they are seen. Now, today we have three cells. And yes, I know that I did add the Savat bodies to it. But then I thought that being a body or a cell which has undergone a change that is apoptotic change, we look at those cells first today. So today it's just going to be three cells, the coilocyte, the hobnail cell, and the foam cell. Now, coilocytes, interesting cells. And these cells become the evidence of a structural change within an epithelial cell or in a keratinocyte that has a virus at, responsible for it. Now, cell injury manifests at different levels, and we are trained to recognize the evidence of those morphological changes. So this particular cell that is a coilocyte is the evidence of a viral cytopathic effect. Now, what is viral cytopathic effect? These are a set of changes in cell morphology that is caused by an infecting virus. Now, all viruses have cytopathic effect, and depending upon whether they are RNA or DNA viruses, those effects may be manifested in different parts of the cell. So while the slide may seem a little crowded, we look at multiple types of cytopathic effects that would bring about morphological alterations, which we, we would be able to recognize. So if you look at the left hand, the morphological alterations begin with the nuclear features. It also has cytoplasmic vacuolation or cells forming, fusing together to form polykaryocytes. The chromosomes can be broken up and the cells themselves can undergo a ballooning type of change. And then of course you have various inclusion bodies all of these are evident as the evidence that we can look at as a virus has or is the culprit or the behind the crime scene, so to speak. So when it comes to the human papilloma virus, we are looking at what is known as the HPV cytopathic effect. So what we see here is that the infected cell remains metabolically active so that the virus can replicate, but there is evidence of change in the cytoskeleton, something that we can pick up. And because of these changes that are produced by the HPV virus as a productive infection, it changes a keratinocyte, that is the epithelial cell, into a coilocyte. So for a conventional definition of a coilocyte, it would be Coilocytes are epithelial cells that contain an acentric, hyperchromatic, moderately enlarged nucleus that is displaced by a large perinuclear vacuole. Now, there are some points in this definition that you need to pay attention to, and that is the nucleus is the one that is acentric, it's hyperchromatic, and moderately enlarged. Of course, the larger or the obvious feature would be that perinuclear vacuole, but remember these points about the nucleus as well. So as Mandana mentioned, we do have a pasha for who discovered the first, the cell at the very beginning or whose name is attributed to the cell. So here we have this coilocyte. It was not discovered by an oral pathologist, but a gynecologist that was J. Ernest Eyre, a Canadian. And he originally observed it in the uterine cervix. And at that point, it was called halo cells. The term that we use now, coilocytes, was given by Coss and Durfee, who called these cells as coilocytes because of the hollow or the empty appearance, appearance of the cell. Now, where do you see coilocytes? Coilocytes, of course, as we said, are seen in the epithelium because they are infecting epithelial cells. But which level of epithelium are they evident or will you want to observe these coilocytes? 
Now, when it comes to the HPV virus, you must remember that the HPV virus or the expression of those viral genes is tightly linked to the state of cellular differentiation. So we've heard of terminal differentiation as the cells mature from the basal layers, move through the different strata of the epithelium and finally exfoliate in the stratum corneum. So we find that the expression of the viral genes and the viral replication that we have, we find is linked to this particular differentiation or maturation process of the epithelium. So when it comes to HPV or the coilocyte, we see that these are observed in the upper maturing spinous layer of the stratified squamous epithelium. So you're looking at stratum spinosum and you're looking at stratum granulosum. That's about the level where you would see these coilocytes. Now, coilocytes also show some changes that, or the cells which are adjacent to the coilocytes will also show some changes that you can, that will draw your attention to the presence of these cells. So as we mentioned earlier, we have the perinuclear clearing, and this, remember, is glycogen negative because there are a lot of reasons why cells may appear clear. And in coilocytes in particular, these are not containing glycogen. So to repeat our earlier point of note, that is the nucleus has to be enlarged, eccentric, hyperchromatic. The chromatin is coarse and it appears sometimes vesiculated or it might be homogeneous. Now the nuclear margin again is crenated. That means it has a convoluted type of margin referred to as being raisinoid or spoon-like. If you remember coilonychia, spoon-shaped nails, Again, it's having a similar or a word similarity with coilocytes, empty appearing, spoon shaped. That's the etymology of the word. So the normal rounded contours of the nucleus is lost. Sometimes the nucleus may be multiple. And some of the investigators attribute this multiple appearance of the nuclei to an actual multilobation. It may or may not be multinucleated as well. So we also see that the cytoplasm then is pushed to the periphery and forms a rim that is around the vacuole. Now, coilocytes is a descriptive. That means we're looking at a cell and describing its appearance, but and that's what we do in anatomic pathology. But then what is the importance of this coilocyte is that it can involve clinical pathology by prompting HPDNA to see coilocytes within your slides, then you might want to think of testing for HPV, particularly the oncogenic forms of HPV. Now, the ultrastructural appearance of coilocytes shows that this perinuclear vacuole is forming within the cell. And at the same time, we can also see the perinuclear vacuole that's out here. And you can see in the ultrastructure the tightly packed viral particles, which are all seen in the nucleus, where the viral particles are assembling. So that's looking at the HPV, both the cytology and the histopathology, and at the ultrastructural level. Now, coming to the life cycle, which is going to explain to us how exactly this coilocyte forms, that is, what are the mechanisms which drive the formation of coilocytes. Now here we must also remember that most of the information that we have about HPV and coilocytes and the changes that are produced are sourced from gynecological pathology. That means looking at the uterine cervix, that is from where most are, of our observations come. So while these have been extrapolated to the oral tissues, there may be a few points of difference that you would like to consider. So we all are familiar with the DNA of the HPV. This is a DNA virus, which has a circular double-stranded DNA. And then you have these early and late genes which are arranged. We have the E1, E2. The E3 is not there. E4, E5, E6, and E7, which make the virus oncogenic. And then, of course, you have the L1 and the L2, which are coding for structural proteins for the capsid proteins. So HPV enters the oral tissues through microtrauma and infects the basal keratinocytes. So it moves all the way down to 
the basal keratinocytes, stratum basale, through a minor or a micro trauma on the surface. Now, at this level, the expression of HPV is episomal. And of course, as we mentioned earlier, it is synchronized with keratinocyte maturation. Now, all of these genes, that is the early and the late genes, are involved in different aspects of viral progression, that is from primary infection, genome maintenance cell replication, amplification, maturation assembly, and finally shedding. Now, our focus today is going to be on these three important ones which are which will be the focus because they are the ones that are responsible for the coilocyte formation so what we see is that when the virus infects the basal cell layer we see that the cell then progresses up from the basal cell layer or the infection progresses from the basal cell layer the viral genes are expressed, as we can see out here, as the cell moves through the different strata. And as it comes to stratum spinosum granulosum, this is where we begin to see the evidence of E5, E6. And as it moves above to the stratum corneum or to the superficial granulosum, that is where we begin to see expression of E4. Now, why am I talking about these? Because E5, E6, and E4 are the ones that are mainly concerned with coilocyte formation. So now you might ask, what is the significance of this cytoplasmic vacuole as such? We're going to be seeing how, does it, how it forms, but then what is its significance? Because this is in the cytoplasm, and we know that, <clears throat> excuse me, HPV is a DNA virus that replicates within the nucleus. Replication and assembly, as we saw earlier, occurs only in the nucleus. So then why does this cytoplasmic vacuole form and what has this coilocyte got to do with the HPV life cycle? So as we mentioned earlier, coilocyte morphology results from an interplay of three early genes, that is E4, E5, and E6. So let's begin with E5. So E5 begins to be expressed in the maintenance in the proliferative area. And E5 induces the formation of pores. It's now called a viroporin. And it also abrogates apoptosis. That means E5 is going to make sure that the cell does not undergo apoptosis before the viral replication is successful. Now, literature tells us that E5 cannot act entirely on its own. E5 requires the expression of E6 to induce the formation of coilocytes. Now, E6 and E7 begin to be expressed much earlier, that is in the formation of or the oncogenic function of the virus. But now let's look at E6. What is E6? This is actually, um, pro it inhibits the pro-apoptotic protein. It mediates resistance to apoptosis and chromosomal instability. So looking at a joint collaboration between E6 and E5 to form a coilocyte. Now, most of the studies have been done on HPV-16. That's why we have HPV-16E6 gene that is being studied. So coilocytosis we see is a feature that is observed with both low and high risk HPV infections. Now, coilocytosis we see again, it is observed in the well-differentiated layers of stratum, of stratified squamous epithelium. And how do we know that it is H or HPV E5 and E6? Now, the people who have done studies on this, that is Krosik et al., they have shown or they have induced in the laboratory using cell lines, that is your primary human ectocervical cells and human foreskin cell lines, 
they have shown in the laboratory the development of coilocytes, which are similar to those seen in, in clinical biopsies and in pap smears. Dr. Anita? Yeah? Sorry, can I disturb you a minute? Can you turn off your video because the speed is falling? Okay. Yeah. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Right. So we were looking at the experimental studies that were done using various cell lines in order to show that the collaboration between HPV E5 and E6 is required for the formation of coilocytes. Now, though these are laboratory studies, and there may be, you might say that these are conditions which may not be seen in an actual clinical infection. So it could be that way, but then we see the mechanism, the mechanism of how a coilocyte is formed. Now, in cell lines, we are not using differentiated cells. The expression of E5 or E6 may be different in a productive infection as compared to a controlled laboratory setting. And only two viral oncogenes are being used for the study, that is E5 and E6. Whereas in a clinical infection, you have the entire viral genome, which is found. So all of that is there, but we have a direct view on how a coilocyte is actually performed or it is actually formed when E6 and E5 are expressed together. On their own, as you can see here, the percentage of coilocytes is much less than other combinations also. But when it comes to the co-expression of these, we find that there is a high percentage of coilocyte expression. Along with what we see with E5 is that it has multiple functions for the life cycle of the, HI, of the HPV virus. But the one that we're looking at in relation to a coilocyte formation is that the, of the action of calpactin. This is what helps in coilocytosis. Now, calpactin promotes membrane fusion. What it does is that part of the 16E5 binds to cal calpactin, redirects it to a perinuclear region. And that is what helps in perinuclear membrane fusion, which then moves on to facilitate the formation of coilocytic vacuoles. Now, 16E5 was localized to coilocytic vacuolar membranes. It was also noted within the cytoplasm. Okay. Now, then what about HPV 16E6? So from the same experiment, HPV 16E6 was also required, as we have seen earlier, inhibiting the pro-apoptotic protein mediating resistance to apoptosis and so forth. So coilocytosis is promoted by the E6, E5 acting together. Now, what about HPV4, E4? Now, E4 expression is seen higher up in the strata where the virus is being assembled together before it is packaged and released. So what happens here is that E4, the role of E4 is helping in spread of the virus or break out of the virus through the infected cell. Now it helps in potentiating viral release and spread. How does it do that? Now HPV E4 protein is synthesized as a fusion protein with E1. This is a function of mRNA splicing. And this E4 protein in the form of a fusion protein was found to contain a leucine cluster motif. Now this proximity to the end terminus of the E4 protein is integral to the association of this fusion protein with keratin intermediate filaments. Now keratin intermediate filaments, as we know, helps to anchor the nucleus within the cell. It finds attachment in the nuclear membrane as well as in the plasma membrane of the cell, giving structural form to the cell. 
So the E4 protein associates with the keratin intermediate filaments. It also self-associates through with other E4 proteins through the C-terminal domain. Now, because of this association with keratin intermediate filaments and a self-association with other E4 proteins, the entire cytoskeleton framework of the cell tends to get reorganized. So what happens is the cytokeratin filament is relocated towards the cell periphery. Now, we spoke about how the chromatin appears to be larger or disseminated. This is because of the fact that the keratin or the chromatin becomes within the nucleus, that is, it becomes spread out. We'll see that as we move later. But here, coming back to the cytokeratin fil filament network, these cytokeratin filament networks, they assemble into fibers that resemble amyloid. So as you move up from stratum granulosum through to corneum during the terminal differentiation process, the plasma membrane of the cell gets thickened. That is the cornification of the plasma membrane takes place. And this is what is hampered when it comes to the action of E4. Now, this is a slide which shows you how the keratin filaments get reorganized. Apart from getting disrupted and reorganized, we also see that there is a depletion of keratin in those cells where you have this fusion protein. So when we imagine the cell structure, a function of a normal keratin intermediate filaments along with its formation of the desmosomal attachments, what we're seeing here is that there is a disruption of this because of the action of the fusion protein. We are also seeing that as a result of phosphorylation and ubiquitylation, there is also depletion of keratin in those cells where this particular protein accumulates. So where does this particular protein accumulate? It is accumulating in the superficial or in the strata, which is your granulosum and corneum. Now, there is another function to this, that is the granules that we see in these viral infections in HPV viral, which we describe as coarse keratohyaline granules, are also attributed to E4 as being inclusion granules. So they also accumulate in the superficial strata. While the precise composition of these granules is not known, it is also, it is thought that they are made up of the E4 protein. Now, it is not in all variants or in all types of HPV that we find these inclusion granules. It is dependent upon the particular type of HPV where the granules appear. Okay. Now, we had mentioned how the cornification of the cell takes place, how the thickening of the plasma membrane takes place with the in normal keratinization. If you recall, we have those lamellar bodies we have the action of transglutaminase enzyme, involucrin, filagrin, the cross-linking that is taking place, and the plasma membrane thickens to form your keratinized squam. So we find that transglutaminase is an important enzyme that has multiple biological functions, one of which is cytoskeletal rearrangements. So we see that in the coilocyte, there is an expression in early lesions, and it is supposed or it is thought to be a cellular response to the presence of HPV. And the transglutaminase 2 is expressed in coilocytes. It has expressions in both the nucleus as well as the cytoplasmic areas. So here we can see that how all of these actions of E4 with the fusion protein that it forms, E5, E6, all collaborate to form the coilocyte. So then we come to what are the recommended techniques for detection? So we have these various techniques that are used for detection of HPV. And in order to be able to say that, yes, this particular cell, a perinuclear vacuole, is due to an HPV infection, you would have to detect the presence of HPV within that particular section. So the various techniques available 
are listed as these. Now, this is a case that was reported, and it is unusual because it was reported in an oral lipoma. Now, that's not one of the usual places that you would want or that you would expect to see a coilocyte, but as the author said, expect the unexpected. And if you look at figure E, you can see that coilocytes are being expressed in the epithelium and, or rather there is HPV 16 being expressed here and also along with the adipocytes showing P16 positivity. And that's taking a closer look at the scoilocytic change with the expression of P16. So then that brings us to what are the conditions associated with coilocytosis? Now, HPV infections, a large percentage are seen to have coilocytosis. As we said, seen in the upper layers, you can see the basilar hyperplasia that is caused here. And as the differentiation progresses, the coilocytes that are formed in oral lesions and common oral lesions where you would expect to see coilocytes in multifocal epithelial hyperplasia, the oral verruca vulgaris, papillomas, condyloma, acuminatum. These are all lesions attributed to HPV and find clinical manifestation within the oral mucosa. So the presence of coilocytes can be seen in all of these lesions. Another condition that we need to remember is oral coilocytic dysplasia. This oral coilocytic dysplasia was initially described as having unknown biologic potential, but what is important is that it exhibits the histologic features of an HPV infection and oral epithelial dysplasia. So it is now referred to as HPV oral epithelial dysplasia because you see two things occurring together and it has a slightly different clinical presentation as compared to leukoplakias or other lesions which would demonstrate epithelial dysplasia. So one of these is a brightly eosinophilic orthokeratin on the surface. It may also be parakeratin. You would see coilocytes may or may not be present, but they are few in number. But what we do see is cariorexis or mitosoid cells, which we see in focal epithelial hyperplasia. But these mitosoid cells are evidence of a breakdown or a cardiorectic effect of, on, of the HPV on the nucleus. Now, Canal et al. had a cytologic scoring system for HPV OED in which other features of OED were, par were included in the scoring system, but coilocytic cells were not included. So the histologic features of HPV relating, we see coilocytosis, you see acanthosis, we may see multinucleated keratinocytes and atypical mitosis. Plus you have features that were difficult to classify as only viral cytopathic effect, or is it a oral epithelial dysplasia? So we look at dyskeratosis, we look at cariorectic cells. Sometimes you see an altered structure referred to as a mitosoid cell. We also see hyperchromatic shrunken nucleus, bright cytoplasmic eosinophilia, which identifies the apoptotic cell. And though we also may see low risk forms of HPV in coilocytic dysplasia, it has also been shown that high risk types may be present. And it is this high risk type that you would be interested in finding in this HPV OED. And that is usually evident with the P16 staining. So next, when you look at 
these cells, which are large cells with a perinuclear halo raisinoid nucleus, we know that there are a lot of cells which can appear this way in the oral tissues. It's quite difficult sometimes to differentiate what is a oral epithelial normal resident non-keratinocyte, which has a clear appearance, or which could be even an inflammatory phenomenon oral samples which are associated with mechanical irritation, all of these can show perinuclear clearing or vacuolation. So we have these mimics which may be due to also glycogen content or accumulation of water, as we call it keratinocyte edema. You can have accumulation of intermediate filaments, zymogen granules, Infiltration with local anesthetic solution, which is an artifact, can also give rise to these cell changes apart from the non-keratinocytes. So in all of this, all of these cells are found in the oral epithelium and you might find it difficult to distinguish one from the other. Is this a coilocyte or is it an artifact or some other change within the cell? So if you want to be able to at least have some measure of discriminating between these. You look at within the slide, a cell with a perinuclear halo, then you ought to ask yourself, where is the cell found? Is it low level? Is it at an intermediate level or is it superficial? So if it is at a low level, think of melanocytes because these are non-resident or non keratinocytes which are resident in the oral epithelium. Are they superficial or intermediate? You could have cells which are your Langerhans cells which can appear clear with a coffee bean type of nucleus. You can have cells which have this clearing. The nucleus appears to be pushed to one side. Are we looking at a keratinocyte? Are we looking at a coilocyte? So check out the levels. Then we look at the perinuclear halo. You see a perinuclear halo. What is the color, the size, the shape, and the position of the nucleus? So is the nucleus hyperchromatic? Is it enlarged? Does it have a raisinoid border? Is it eccentric? Or is it in the center of the cell, not pushed to any one side? center, small halo. But here we see that the cells have a pale ballooned appearance to it. The cytoplasm is not pushed to the rim. So here you're not looking at a coilocyte, but you're looking at keratinocyte edema. So these could be mimics of the original coilocyte. As we mentioned before, you can look where is the cytoplasm? Is there any cytoplasm? No cytoplasm. That means the cytoplasm could have either been lost as a result of processing or some kind of artifact due to irritation of the epithelium keratinocyte. Is the epithelium attached to the nucleus? Cytoplasm attached to the nucleus? You could be looking at a melanocyte. Perivacuolar, the cytoplasm has to be in a perivacuolar distribution that establishes it to be a coilocyte. The cytoplasm has to be eosinophilic and rimming the plasma membrane. Other conditions which may possibly mimic coilocytosis, oral hairy leukoplakia where you find evidence of the Epstein-Barr virus and the presence of coilocyte-like cells. They do not have all the typical features of the coilocyte as we have described, but these can be mimics. So that brings us to the end of coilocytes as we move on to the next cell, that is the foam cell. Now, foam cells are also known as lipid-laden macrophages, foamy macrophage, or xanthoma cells, and these are histiocytes. They have elongated or oval vesicular or condensed nuclei. 
a finely granular or vacuolated or a bubbly type of cytoplasm with ill-defined cell borders. So moving on to the foam cell, the same headings that we will be looking at. Foam cells are derived from macrophages. They can be derived from endothelial cells and they can also be derived from smooth muscle cells. And the key event in foam cell biogenesis or the formation of a foam cell is the intranuclear accumulation of lipid droplets. And that changes from disease to disease. Now, what are the mechanisms by which they are formed relating to a receptor-based uptake of low-density lipids, low-density lipids, oxidized low-density lipids, lipopolysaccharides of bacterial origin. All of these can find their way into the cell via specific receptors. They could be pathogen-mediated, phagocytosis and macropenocytosis. It could also be a result of mRNA sequences which have been identified as regulating or governing foam cell formation. So while this schematic explains how the lipids are taken up, the low density lipids are taken up through scavenger receptors into the cell cytoplasm and then follows a course as they move on to the formation of triglycerides and cholesterol esters, finally exiting as a cholesterol crystal or moving it into the serum as high density lipids. So whatever low density lipids or lipids which enter into the cell, they are broken down within the cell into their constituent parts. So you have phospholipids, triacylglycerides, and cholesterol. Now within the macrophage, phospholipids and triacylglycerides are metabolized, but now we focus on cholesterol. Cholesterol get, gets esterified. It is retained within the macrophage as lipid droplets. What are lipid droplets? They are quasi-organelles. They consist of storage neutral lipids, primarily in the form of cholesterol esters and or triglycerides. These are surrounded by phospholipids, which contain various proteins and traces of free cholesterol. So this is happening when a macrophage imbibes the low density lipids. So how is this processed within the macrophage? Now, under normal conditions or during homeostasis, phagocytes are well equipped to deal with relatively minor increases of cholesterol. So they function to export this retained cholesterol through the action of an ATP binding cassette transporters, which then release these high density lipoproteins into the serum. Cholesterol homeostasis is maintained then by a balance between influx of low density lipids into the macrophage and efflux pathways as high density lipoproteins into the serum. But when there is dysfunctional processing that takes place, that means when the macrophages are now faced with large amounts of lipids entering in and therefore they accumulate large amounts of cholesterol, not only do they store the excess cholesterol within the lipid droplets, they also extrude this excess of unesterified cholesterol into the extracellular matrix, both which surround the macrophages or into the connective tissues, which we see as cholesterol crystals, which are collecting around these foam cells or the foamy macrophages. So this could involve, as we said, you have the entry of low density lipids is through certain or specific receptors. So there could be a faulty feedback regulation of those receptors. So there's uncontrolled uptake of cholesterol containing particles. Lysosomal dysfunction will allow for cholesterol to accumulate within the lysosomes. From here, the cholesterol formation and cholesterol crystals then activate caspase, which forms inflammasomes. 
And then this cholesterol, when it is moved to the endoplasmic reticulum, can cause stress in the endoplasmic reticulum and an unfolded protein response, which then hampers the capacity of the foamy macrophages to process the cholesterol within the lipid droplets. And it cannot now dispose of the intracellular cholesterol. And in this, you have multiple mRNA sequences which target genes which are involved in macrophage, cholesterol, homeostasis. So all of these factors drive the formation of the foamy macrophage. So when we see that the lipid accumulation exceeds the homeostatic capacity of macrophages, you have a foamy macrophage. And when this cholesterol is extruded into the extracellular matrix, it gets concentrated locally, gets crystallized, and forms a very familiar cholesterol crystals, which can then induce a foreign body reaction. So in a nutshell, foam cells form through dysregulated lipid metabolism in mammalian macrophages. Now, when a monocyte turns into a macrophage and then turns into a foamy macrophage, we find that the size of the cell enlarges. The macrophage, as you know, is a big eater. That's what the term means. And if the cell is going to become big, it would mean that there has to be some amount of cytoskeletal remodeling that is taking place. So what happens out here, we see that in response to the chemokine stimulation that the inflammatory setting affords, the actin cytoskeleton of macrophages undergoes extensive remodeling. And together with CD36, this is also part of the scavenge, scavenger receptor, which mediates internalization of the low density lipids. So what happens here is that the clustering of these receptors occurs within the actin poor zones, enhancing the cell surface binding of low density lipids, which then accelerates the foam cell formation. And together with a reduced expression of beta tubulin, you find that the cell can accommodate more lipid and the foam cell or the foamy macrophage enlarges. So not only is it a big eater, but it also now becomes large in size because of the cytoskeletal remodeling that we see associated with the foamy macrophage. So that brings us to the fact that we cannot look at a foam cell and say that, okay, this is a foam cell. It is just showing some amount of fatty tissue or fatty molecules present within the foam cell. It's a big eater, but that doesn't mean that it has a laid back approach like a couch potato. We often tend to dismiss foam cells as being not very significant. But we see that foam cells are involved in various kinds of diseases, metabolic diseases. We find cancer, autoimmune diseases, inflammatory diseases, various categories in which foam cells are present. Foam cells can have different functions associated, all relating to various processes, including inflammation, necrosis, all of these then combine to produce outcomes within the disease, either inflammation, damage to tissues, or pathogen survival. This is particularly seen in case of mycobacterium tuberculosis infections. So that is a list of diseases that we see associated with foam cells. We'll be looking at a few of them. apical periodontitis and radicular cysts. We see that the lipopolysaccharides from the bacterial infections or the products of cell or products of the root canal which is infected will then move into the immediate periapical region where it can then give rise to apical periodontitis. And this then progresses to form a periapical cyst, a periapical granuloma, or a periapical cyst. 
So here we see that there is a definite role for the Fermi macrophage as it forms. And within this Fermi macrophage, you can even see here a cholesterol crystal that is formed as the foam cell accumulates the cholesterol. Tuberculous granuloma. This is another lesion where we see the effect of foam cells. In a tuberculous granuloma that forms as a result of mycobacterium tuberculosis infection, lipid bodies are generated within the infected cells. Now, lipids are overproduced by the bacilli that reside within these macrophages. And the most these lipids then become multivesicular bodies, which are then exocytosed into the extracellular areas. And among these lipids, the most active one is a trihalose dimycolate. These are derived from the mycolic acids, which are part of the mycobacterium tuberculosis. So within these tuberculous granulomas, we find that it is inside the foam cell that the microbacteria can hide and survive. So foam cells accumulate in the outermost ring, in the outer portion of the tuberculous granuloma. This is where you will find foam cells accumulating along with epithelioid cells and macrophages. In the center, we see the casein, which is rich in lipid and debris, which have formed as the foam cells have released their product to form this cheesy caseation material. That is the death of foamy cells within the granuloma, accumulation of the lipids, and aggregation of the debris is what results or what forms this caseation type of necrosis. So in tuberculosis, it is you, you can remember that the foam cells actually help the mycobacterium to survive. So if we consider the schematic, we see that in a TB granuloma environment, which is moving towards, sorry, which is favoring bactericidal function versus a tuberculous granuloma that favors bacterial persistence, we see the formation or the presence of foam cells. If this half of the schematic is representing the TB granuloma environment that favors bactericidal function, we see you can have the macrophages, we see epithelioid cells, inflammatory cells, but in this half where we find that there is bacterial persistence and the mycobacteria are actually surviving it is because of the formation of foam cells here. And these foam cells are the ones that are responsible for allowing organisms to survive. What are some of the other conditions in which we see foam cells? The two main ones that we looked at foam cells, most of the work that is done on foam cells is done on atherosclerotic plaques in tuberculosis. But we also see foam cells in other settings. And what are these settings? In the rhinoscleroma. In rhinoscleroma, which is a disease caused by Klebsiella rhinosclerotis, which can affect the oral tissues as well, we see clusters of macrophages which have clear to foamy cytoplasm, and these are referred to as Mikulic cells in this particular setting. The other situation where we have accumulations of foam cells are in xanthomas xanthomatosis or xanthogranulomas. Xanthoma cell is another word that is used for the foam cell. So what are these xanthomas, xanthomatosis or xanthogranulomas? Xanthomatosis is when you have multiple bone lesions. Xanthomas, it may be single. Xanthogranuloma is a reactive or a developmental, it could even be an inflammatory lesion which is a non-Langerhans cell histiocytosis. And typically associated with the xanthomas are the Tutor giant cell, which arises as a result of fusion of foam cells. Now, a Tutor giant cell is recognized by the fact that it forms a wreath or a ring-like arrangement of the nuclei, enclosing homogeneous cytoplasm. But at the periphery, we see a foamy cytoplasm.
So that's a typical appearance of Teuton's giant cell. You can see the foam cells here in the background, which then fuse to form the Teuton giant cell in the xanthomas. Examples of xanthomas, you have the verruciform xanthoma. In the verruciform xanthoma, what we see is that the foam cells typically accumulate in the connective tissue papillae. There are different clinical forms, but the foam cells or the xanthoma cells are located here in these connective tissue papillae. They can be identified by the stains for macrophages, the immunohistochemical general macrophage marker and the polarized macrophage marker. So we see that in this case, the question that you might ask here is why is it that they form only in this particular location? Why don't we see it elsewhere? It is because the epithelium are sites of basal cells. The epithelial cells are sites of lipid biosynthesis. And we see that here the basal cells are damaged by T cells. And we find that because of disruption of the basal lamina, there is squamatization of the basal cells where the basal cells look now parallel with the basement membrane. There is sign, that is a sign of chronic epithelial damage. There is also some amount of cytolysis of the basal cells. And this is what draws the macrophages into that particular region where we see clusters of these cells for the verruciform xanthoma. The primary xanthoma or the central xanthoma of the jaws is a rare condition which is seen intraosseous. It can be seen within the jaw bones as well. So we see that here within the jaw bones, we are also looking at clusters or accumulation of foam cells. Now, central xanthoma of the jaw bones was initially considered to be a reactive process. Some investigators consider it to have a neoplastic etiology. It may be associated with some pre-existing condition like a bone cyst or an aneurysmal bone cyst or even fibrous dysplasia. It's not associated with a systemic hyperlipidosis. Now, it can be infiltrative and it is capable of considerable destruction of the jaw bones. It can even cause bone expansion. So recurrence, while it has not been reported, neither has spontaneous resolution been observed. And because of its infiltrative nature, it is thought to be a neoplastic type of lesion. So here also, we can see the accumulation of foam cells within the central areas of bone. Next, we come to a disease which is also characterized by foam cells. That is the Neiman-Pick disease. The Neiman-Pick disease results in a deficiency or is a result of a deficiency of sphingomyelinase. And a deficiency of sphingomyelinase then results in the toxic accumulation of lipids and cholesterol within cells. It, and as these cells collect, the tissues are damaged, organs are damaged, and the neiman pick cell is a foamy macrophage. A close relative here is the Gaucher cell, but here you find that the cytoplasm has a different appearance, a pleated or a folded appearance called a crumpled silk appearance. We're looking here at the neiman pick cell, which is the result of deficiency of sphingomyelinase leading to accumulation of lipids, and that is your foamy macrophage. Now, sclerosing polycystic adenoma, this is a salivary gland lesion. This particular condition has also been associated with the, or uh, shows foam cells in the histopathology the sclerosing polycystic adenoma. So what we see here is that there are ductal cells and these ductal cells can show foam cells which are present. Apart from foam cells, these cells can also show some apocrine mucus or clear cells, but the sclerosing polycystic adenoma is a 
sclerosing benign tumor of salivary glands. We have cystic ductal structures and a variable cystic lining. And it is this cystic lining that can show you the presence of these foam cell, vacuolated foam cell type of macrophages. So this is another clinical or another situation where we can see the presence of foam cells. Now, what other type of cell can closely resemble a foam cell? The closest that I could think of was the sebaceous cells in Fordyce granules. Now, the sebaceous cells or sebocytes also form sebum, which contains triglycerides, fatty acids, cholesterol, and this can closely resemble the foam cells. They appear foamy anyways, and this would be a close mimic of the foam cell. So when we see foam cells in a lesion, the appearance of foam cells, what does it signify? Most commonly, it signifies cell injury that releases some amount of lipids. So that could be trauma, inflammation, infection. It also tells you that there are cells which are scavenging all the debris that is either of cells which are damaged or in organis or organisms as a result of the immune response. Foam cells can also be seen because of a dyslipidosis. That means there is excess circulating plasma lipids. And accumulation of lipids within a cell can also be part of a storage disorder. And in fact, Tangier disease, this is a disease which shows the presence of foam cells. It is a genetic deficiency in the ABCA1, severe high density lipoprotein deficiency and foam cells accumulate instead in tissues. And these patients have an increased susceptibility to develop atherosclerosis. And as we have seen, it can also be foam cells can also be part of a neoplastic process. So with that, we conclude with foam cells and the last cell for today is the hobnail cell. Now, synonyms of the hobnail cell are tufting, bulging, apical snouting, matstick, comet tail, or teardrop appearance of cells which are hobnail. Now, it was Tang et al. who first used the term hobnail to describe very specific features. What kind of features? The loss of cellular polarity. And they were studying, of course, the papillary thyroid carcinoma. That is where this cell or this particular appearance of the cell was first described. So there is a loss of cell polarity. The nucleus of the cell is located in the middle or at the top of the cells. And this is what gave the typical hobnail appearance a nucleus which is situated either in the middle or in the top of the cell. These are cytological air pictures and these are of the papillary thyroid carcinoma where the hobnail cell was first described. So this hobnail pattern, what it signifies is it is a cell which has a high nuclear cytoplasmic ratio, which means the nucleus is enlarged. This nucleus is apically placed occasionally may be grooved. And because it is a pikily placed, it can produce a surface bulge. Now, hobnail cells can vary in size. They can be small or they can be larger. And it is usually associated with loss of cellular polarity. We can see that there has been a shift of the nucleus and there is loss of cohesiveness, which means that these cells, the hobnail cells are now discohesive. And the cytoplasm is densely eosinophilic. The cell borders are well-defined. Now, the hobnail pattern is described first in the papillary thyroid carcinoma, describing a hobnail variant of it. And you have hobnail patterns which are used to describe cells which have this apical bulge in a variety of diseases, both benign as well as malignant. Now, when it comes to the papillary thyroid carcinoma, the true hobnail cell shows reversal of polarity, a pical nuclei protruding from cytoplasm. It is discohesive and it confers aggressive behavior. 
This is true for papillary thyroid carcinoma where the cell was first identified and described. Now we have, or we associate the hobnail cell with an odontogenic lesion that is the glandular odontogenic cyst. Now while hobnail cells can also be seen in certain vascular lesions and there are mimics to it, we look at this particular lesion where the glandular or the criteria for identifying a glandular odontogenic cyst includes the superficial eosinophilic cuboidal or hobnail cells. Right, so these are the eosinophilic cuboidal hobnail cells on the surface of the cystic lining and they resemble the cells of the reduced enamel epithelium. Apocrine snouting is a word that is used to describe the hobnail cell which has a pinched off appearance wherein it looks as though the cell has been decapitated that has its head cut off in other words and the secretions are seen leaving the cell. So these are the two terms that we use in the GOC to describe features of the cyst lining. Now, while it is necessary for diagnosis, paradoxically, it is not diagnostic of GOC. That is what the literature says. So you do see hobnail cells, but you cannot diagnose a GOC on the basis of hobnail cells alone. We need to see the other criteria also, which go for the diagnosis of the uh, GOC. So here we have all of the features of a GOC which have been shown in a series. This was a study done by RSAB et al. And here we see that in D, there are cuboidal eosinophilic cells or hobnail cells along with vacuolated cells in the basal layer. So taking a closer look at those cells which are described as being hobnail in appearance. Being epithelial, these cells stain with cytokeratin. This is one of our departmental slides which shows the same kind of the nucleus which is seemingly protruding out of the cell. We have the same features identified here. Now, we also see that odontogenic cysts demonstrate a phenomenon referred to as prosoplasia. So this means that you can have various kinds of features that are seen and it may not always be what you think it is. What do I mean by that? One moment. There can be GOC mimickers, cells which are mimics of this hobnail appearance, which can mimic a GOC. You can have mimics present even within the papillary thyroid carcinoma, which are known to mimic a hobnail cell. So then the question comes, how would you distinguish a GOC from any other odontogenic cyst, which is showing these hobnail cells? One of the ways is in which you can distinguish is one is to show the CK19 positivity, but IHC expression of podoplanin is negative, whereas in dentigerous cysts, it is positive. Now, this is thought to be able to distinguish a GOC from a dentigerous cyst, which can show similar prosoplastic changes. So then coming to what are some of the other conditions where we see hobnail cells? We see them in salivary duct carcinoma. So in salivary duct carcinoma, you can see these typical cells which demonstrate the hobnail morphology. Also apocrine. You can have the mammary analog secretory carcinoma which can also, which has these cystic spaces and which also demonstrate a hobnail appearance. So hobnail cells can be seen, as we said earlier, in a large variety of cases. And all that qualifies a hobnail cell is that it, it shows a surface bulge 
with the nucleus towards the surface. Mimickers of hobnails can be seen, as we said in the original, and the mimic. You're looking here at a thyroid papillary carcinoma, the true hobnail variant. And then we see um, papillary thyroid carcinoma undergoing degenerative changes. And here, the cells appear to be hobnailed, but they are not showing the true features of the hobnail cell. So this hobnail-like morphology is associated with a cystic change. So the question that can be asked here is that in dent dental or odontogenic cysts, could it be that cystic change is what shows some of these epithelial lining cells to develop a hobnail type of morphology? This is the papillary thyroid carcinoma, which shows this apocrine or decapitation effect. And this here is a dental cyst. This cyst shows the same decapitation effect. It shows these eosinophilic surface cells with protruding. And some of these are pass positive and alcyon blue positive. But this is an odontogenic cyst and not a GOC. So here is where we can apply the podoplanin or the CK19 to be able to distinguish the GOC from its mimics. So all cysts which show hobnail cells are not glandular odontogenic cysts. And so with that, we come to the end of this presentation. I think I have overshot my time. So we've had to rush through this part of it. So thank you very much for a patient hearing. Thank you all for having joined in. And over now to you, Mandana and Dr. Kea. Yes, that was a wonderful presentation. Now there are actually, from what I can see, no questions. Uh, friends, if you have any questions and comments, please post them on uh, our chat. In the meanwhile, I'll hand over to Dr. Kia for her comments and thoughts. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mandana. And uh, I can only say excellent comprehensive presentation, Dr. Anita, which you really covered, you know, the significance, the uh, how to identify and the underlying uh, pathology as to how these cells are formed. Now, you know, I really feel that uh, uh, when we study pathology and when we do histopathology, we identify by patterns. And mm -hmm. often that works, most of the time that works, but sometimes uh, it doesn't work. And so, you know, you have to identify the cells and understand their significance so that you can reach sometimes unexpected diagnosis. Like you said, the lipoma case, which had coelocytes. Now, normally you do not expect uh, HPV in um, uh, lipoma, but if you realize the significance of the coelocytes, then, uh, you know, philosophy of what the mind knows the eye sees. So uh, that's how it goes. So I really feel uh, excellent and a lot of points, which also very important for the PGs from the exam point of view as to the, as you said, the rapid fire questions and the various reasons. So everything covered really. Uh, excellent, excellent. I re uh, really enjoyed it. A lot of learning for me, as, for me and I think for everyone who was watching. Thank you so much. Thank you for your kind words, Kia. Yes, it was actually very, very thorough. And, uh, and, and it definitely fulfilled what we were hoping uh, to cover is that, you know, it's the one stop place where anybody can read anything about these three cells and I don't think they need to check anything else. <laughs> At least for now, maybe two years from now to just update, but definitely right now, nothing more. So let me see who else is with us. And uh, we have Dr. Varun Rastogi. Yes, he watches almost all the sessions. That's very wonderful to have him here. Dr. Akshita Singh, Dr. Ashuja, Dr. Nandini, who is also often with us. Dr. Arpan Shah, uh, Suresh Parpandar sir is with us. Hello, sir. Dr. Lalita, who was here just last week. Hi, Lalita. Uh, Dr. Somia Tanaz, who is my niece, and Dr. Afreen Nadaf, who's also often there, Dr. Sangeeta. And uh, yes, and now everyone is telling you that it was an excellent presentation. 
Uh, beautiful presentation that's from Dr. Nandini. Excellent presentation from Dr. Varun. Dr. Afrin says, crisp presentation. Uh, Dr. Kotrishati, Vijay Lakshmi is with us. Hi, uh, Vijay Lakshmi. She says, beautifully covered. And uh, okay, there is one question I think I can see. Dr. Nandini, could you please elaborate what is that? Role of macrophages in cancer. I think one last question has just come in. Yeah. Right. Role of macrophages in cancer has to do with the polarization of, micro, of the macrophages. So you have the M2 or the tumor associated macrophages. Now, where you have a pro-inflammatory or a pro-tumorigenic role. So between these two subsets of uh, macrophages, the M2 macrophages or the TAMs as they are referred to, these are the ones which actually potentiate the spread of the malignant cells because they can uh, even accompany the cells as it moves to the connective tissues, as it infiltrates into, say, the hematogenous or the lymphatic roots. They also move ahead to the lymph nodes where they prime the lymph nodes or they prepare the soil, so to speak, for receipt or in anticipation of the metastatic deposits into the regional lymph nodes. So while macrophages as, um, you know, as a cell is extremely fascinating because it wears different dresses, so to speak, you have to be able to recognize it under all the kinds of camouflage that it you know, puts on. And in cancer, I believe that there are studies which are also targeting M2 macrophages in order to be able to control particularly the metastatic aspect of uh, cancers. And there is, of course, much more to you know the role of macrophages, the release of cytokines, etc., which can also help in growth of the lesion. And that's the most that I can think of at this time. Yes, Dr. Kia, I think there are more questions that are coming. You can take those. Uh, we have another question okay. from Dr. Nandini. Uh, yeah. She says uh, the zinc cells in pemphigus. Could would you think? of them as mimickers for the hobnail cells? Well, if you go to the exact or the precise definition or you know the description of a true hobnail cell, that is there is reversal of polarity. There is loss of cohesiveness. I think the Zang cells only show the loss of cohesiveness. Besides, they are clumped together. Hobnail mm -hmm. cells do not clump together, though they exhibit discohesiveness. All that they are seeing is that apart from the reversal of polarity and the increase in nuclear cytoplasmic ratio, you know, the original description does not really fit with other diseases, you know, that we describe, especially the GOC or even other cases where even in hemangiomas, it is said that you have the targetoid hemosiderin hemangioma, which shows a hobnail cell. But if you look at images, all it shows is that the cells are protruding above the lumen. So Zang cells are formed in a completely different manner. So to call them a hobnail cell, even as a descriptive, I wouldn't want to use the term hobnail to describe a Zang cell because of then there are nuclear changes, there are cell outline changes, which are not seen in hobnails. Yeah, and also I think uh, the location, no? hobnail cells, yes. I think right on the surface in- On the surface, that's true. This is within the epithelia. That's right. That's an important uh, point of difference, yes. Yeah, I think uh, that answers Dr. Nandini's question. Yes, I think with that, we have finished all the questions. Yeah, uh, we have also with us today, Dr. Sushmita Saxena. Hi, ma'am. Yes, she is, Good I think afternoon. first time, at least she is <laughs> joining us. Anyway, it's nice to have her. There is a little surprise that we can, uh, it's good she's here. We will tell her why now in a little while. So <laughs> let me just share the screen. Yes, are you all seeing oh, that? Thank yes. you. Uh, thank you for all that effort. And that was a lovely presentation. Thank you. Uh, it was great. I, I don't know what thank else to say besides that. Me. It was great. <laughs> You're most welcome. Our pleasure. Thank you. And yes, and this one is for Dr. Kia. Thank you so much for being yeah. here, moderating the session. I know you were busy and you made the time. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. And yes, and of course, thank you to everybody else who makes this possible every week. After week, you know, it's just knowing that all of you are watching and everyone is there that makes it possible to keep, much as I love doing this, but it also helps that I know that you all are watching and I, I can keep coming back and doing this. And everyone who is presenting can keep coming and doing this. Like I said, it's the 46th one, which means by the end of April, we will have 50 videos. And never that thought of it. Wonderful. We started. We half a yeah. century. <laughs> yes, quite. Never really thought of it when we started. Uh, but it's, yeah, yeah it's, it's been great. So now as to why I was saying it would be wonderful that uh, if Dr. Sushmita joins us, considering she is the president of our association. And... Uh, well, uh, the thing is that we are going to have this brainstorming session about our curriculum in a way, or more accurately to just say, uh, what is happening today? Is, it, uh, is the training, the oral pathology training today, good for now? In the sense, it has been perfect before for, for its own time. What is it like for now? Do we need to change? What needs to stay? What? And this is, of course, going to be just the individual opinion of everybody who will be taking part. Uh, just our own thoughts. Getting a conversation going is just the idea. So it will be very nice uh, if all of you come back and get as many more to come in. If you want to, you know, post and send us some questions beforehand, also wonderful. Otherwise, you can, of course, take part and just uh, put in your comments in the chat. It's something that matters a lot, I think, mostly to our youngsters. And I do hope everybody will be uh, definitely there and will uh, take part with us. So that is uh, as far as next week's program goes. And then, um, yep. And yes, with that, we have reached the end. And thank you, everyone, for being here. And see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, Mandana. Bye. Bye, Kia. Bye. 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 See you all. Anisha. See you.